The following program is sponsored by Capital Blue Cross. El siguiente programa es auspiciado por Capital Blue Cross. Bienvenidos a otro segmento de Cita con su Salud. Esta mañana vamos a estar hablando sobre un tema muy importante y el tema tiene que ver con la diabetes entre niños y adolescentes. Conmigo esta mañana está Charlotte Wessner, quien es una médica asociada eh, con el Southeast Lancaster Health Services. Charlotte. Good morning. I want to thank you for being uh, with us today on Cita con su Salud. Uh, and we're going to talk about, obviously, childhood diabetes and obesity. Let's go very basic now um, for folks. What is diabetes, number one? Okay, so um, type, type one diabetes, um, this one is more of a genetic basis, and it's our body has a decreased ability to actually produce insulin. And so the onset of that is usually young. Um, type 2 diabetes is caused from our body's uh, inability to break down and process sugars correctly. And so type 2 diabetes is, in the past was considered an adult disease. And the um, main cause was being overweight, um, poor dietary choices, and an irregularity in blood sugar because of that. Mm -hmm. So um, Type 1 is more genetically based, type 2 mm -hmm. is more lifestyle based. Mm -hmm. eh, la pregunta que le hice a, a Charlotte básicamente es, ¿qué es la diabetes? Y hay dos tipos de diabetes. La número uno, eh, básicamente es producida debido más a cuestiones genéticas del ser humano. La número dos, tiene que ver más con estilo de, de vida. Eh, lo que uno come, eh, quizás hacer ejercicio, no hacer ejercicio y estar más atento a ese estilo. Y una cosa que dice Charles que en un tiempo el número dos de diabetes eh, era más considerada una enfermedad de adultos, no de niños, pero obviamente eso ha, ha cambiado. Uh, you mentioned that at one time type 2 diabetes was considered an adult disease or condition. Um, we now know that that is not the case. Children now are, you know, young from I don't know how many age, but um, also have type 2 diabetes. Let's go with, in terms of children, what percentage have type 1, what percentage have type 2, roughly? Is, is it the majority have type 2 versus type 1, or, or it's the other way around? Well, the majority of, um, the, when you meet a child who has diabetes, the majority of them are going to have type 1 diabetes. Okay. Um, because that one, that one produces itself and um, presents itself early on, because your body actually cannot produce the insulin. So okay. um, most children that have diabetes, it is not gonna, going to be from weight. And the reason is because once you kind of get to the point to where you have irregularities in your blood sugar because of weight, it takes 10, 15 years for the effects to show up. That's why mm -hmm. it used to be an adult disease mm -hmm. because most children are so active, the lifestyle just was not conducive to mm -hmm. having that weight on for such mm -hmm. a long period of time. But when you look at it that way, that it does take 10, 15 years to develop, the trends are that as we have our children becoming increasingly a higher percentage of them becoming obese, then we'll start seeing an onset of diabetes in their teens, mm -hmm. type 2 diabetes in their mm -hmm. teens. So, But most children that people meet and somebody says, my child has diabetes, it will be type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. la, la pregunta que yo le hice a Charlotte, básicamente, ¿qué porcentaje eh, más o menos de los niños que tienen diabetes tienen eh, la tipo 1 versus tipo 2? Ella indica que la tipo 1 eh, es el más prevalente entre los niños porque básicamente eh, lo que significa el número tipo 1 es que el cuerpo de uno no puede producir insulina pues y eso se manifiesta eh, muy temprano en la edad de, de un niña porque eso viene genéticamente la número 2 como es más a consecuencia de estilo de, de vida se demora a veces 10 a 12 años 
para manifestarse en el cuerpo de eh, un, un adolescente. Pues básicamente, eh, en un, por eso que en un tiempo se consideraba una enfermedad de adultos, porque años atrás, especialmente cuando los niños estaban más activos en sus casas, jugaban en el vecindario, en los parques, en los afueras de la cárcel, de la casa, eh, esa actividad le detenía eh, la de diabetes número 2 de manifestarse en su cuerpo hasta quizás más, más, más tarde. Now, we have the issue of obesity with uh, children and youth, uh, I was going to say in the United States, but it's really around the world at, at, uh, at this point. And uh, first of all, what, what measures do we use to consider a child obese? So um, we base those measurements on their age, height, and weight, mm -hmm. and then place them into a percentile. And so um, if a child is considered overweight, they would be between the 85th and 95th percentile. If a child is considered obese, then they're above the 95th percentile. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's, the, way we, that's the way we look at mm -hmm. it. And the same goes, we can evaluate it just with weight um, or their BMI as well. And mm -hmm. again, with the BMI, it's the same. 85th to 95th percentile would be considered overweight, above the 95th percentile considered obese. Mm -hmm. eh, básicamente lo que pregunté fue que eh, se utiliza, qué medida se utiliza para determinar si un niño está obeso. Uh, básicamente hay ciertos factores, la edad, eh, altura y el peso de ese, de ese niño o niña. Y, y dependiendo en, en, es, en la escala que existe, si está sobre el 90%, eh, también eh, está considerado obeso. Otro factor es eh, la eh, forma la que hay para medir eh, la cantidad de grasa que uno tiene en, en el cuerpo um, y también si está un niño o niña en el 90% para arriba también es considerado eh, o, o, obeso. Um, since type 2 is lifestyle, Obesity, is it mainly caused by lifestyle, that we could say, or 100%? Well, no, it's definitely not 100% okay. caused by lifestyle. Uh, um, lifestyle is a huge factor and impacts the rate that disease processes come on. But for, for obesity, there's a, definitely a genetic link. Mm -hmm. um, uh, studies have shown that what our grandparents and great-grandparents ate in the past um, and whether or not they were... Um, lived in, for instance, people's grandparents who lived through the Depression, mm -hmm. their children and great-grandchildren are a higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes. So there are epigenetic and genetic changes that take place in our recent past mm -hmm. that change the way we process sugars and store fat. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you can't just say it's 100% um, lifestyle. Um, there's definitely a genetic component, but um, what can we do to protect ourselves and protect our bodies is, uh, is adjust our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. eh, una de las cosas eh, importantes de reconocer cuando eh, el por qué tenemos tanta obesidad, eh, había mencionado que una gran parte es estilo de vida, pero también eh, yo menciona que quizás haya unos factores genéticos que influyen en el desarrollo de la diabetes. También, eh, vamos a decir, de la forma que no solamente se, se están criando los niños, pero también cómo se criaron los padres y los abuelos, qué cosas comían, qué tipo de vida ellos llevaban, que todavía esos rastros siguen en nuestras familias actuales y que tienen un impacto sobre la posibilidad de crear eh, niños o, o eso. Um, Southeast Lancaster Health Services um, has a program to work with uh, young people and young families on trying to manage uh, obesity. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, that program and what does that do? Okay, this summer we're starting a six-week weight loss intervention um, called Let's Get Healthy. Mm -hmm. 
and it's for eight to children who are eight to 14 years old, um, above the 85th percentile. And we've got a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we have psychologists, nutrition specialists, um, and we actually have personal trainers who are coming in to work with us on the program. Uh, Charlotte dice que en, en este verano, uh, when does that start exactly? June 21st. Okay, well, ya, ya la semana próxima, already next week. Um, mm -hmm. eh, van a inici eh, iniciar eh, un programa de seis semanas para ayudar a niños y familias eh, contrarrestar la obesidad eh, con eh, ejercicios, también con recomendaciones de dietas, eh, con terapistas físicos y también eh, expertos en cuestión a eh, cosas que pueden hacer en las casas, ejercicios que pueden hacer y los pueden ayudar a orientar a esos um, ejercicios para entonces esas familias continuar eh, poder eh, continuar estos ejercicios y estas iniciativas en sus casas. Um, how many folks do you are you able to uh, work with during that six week uh, period? Well, since this is the first run of it, oh, okay. I'll take as many as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever's willing to show up, and and to know that, um, like the personal trainers that are working with us that have volunteered their time, um, that's just an amazing opportunity. Every we the sessions meet once a week, um, and we have three hour block for it. It probably won't take that entire three hour block, but it's activity based, so it won't just be somebody standing in front of the giving room a lecture. lecturing. No, yeah, yeah every um, there's an exercise. Actually, for five of the session, there is an exercise component. Um, Um, and uh, for one session, we're calling it Night of Nutrition. We're going to let the kids cook, cut mm -hmm. food up, um, do some activities just to teach them about portion control, um, fruits and vegetables, and their benefit, and how they actually work in our body in hopes that if they understand not just like, oh, yeah, they're good for us, but why they're good for us, that they'll maybe make themselves eat something green. Mm -hmm. eh, estas sesiones que se van a empezar el 21 de junio, ya casi en uh, una semana de, de aquí, eh, va a, se llama eh, Let's Get Healthy. Mm -hmm. Y vamos a ponernos saludables. Uh, va a conllevar muchas actividades físicas Uh, porque obviamente la actividad física es importante para que los niños y los jóvenes eh, puedan disminuir su, su peso, pero también van a estar hablando con los niños de cómo ellos mismos pues, se pueden preparar eh, comidas o meriendas saludables eh, en, en, en su casa. Y básicamente que esto no van a ser seis semanas de alguien como en un salón de clase de alguien eh, estar parado diciéndole qué tienen que hacer, qué no tienen que hacer, sino se van a hacer actividades eh, donde los participantes van a jugar un papel bien en cuestión a las actividades interactivos eh, todas las seis semanas que van a estar ahí, porque eh, otra vez hay algunos entrenadores eh, que han dado de su tiempo para este programa como voluntarios para ayudar a los niños y orientarles a ejercicios que pueden hacer en, um, en sus casas. Y esta es la primera vez que se está llevando a cabo estas sesiones uh, y yo le había preguntado cuántas personas eh, pueden participar. Actualmente eh, están... Eh, de todas las personas que están solicitando, todavía hay, uh, se pueden colocar más personas, pues entre más pronto se puedan eh, contactar con, con ellos y vamos a dar el teléfono eh, al final del segmento para que ustedes tengan la información de cómo uh, y cuándo deben de sol solicitar para este programa. Um, One of the key things about um, obesity, we know that also a lot of children are bullied. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
because they 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 are obese. Are 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 these sessions going to address some of that issue? Yeah, and our, our last session, our um, counselor that works closely with Southeast, uh -huh. uh, Alex Pineda, uh -huh. he's um, he's going to be coming in, and we're, we'll we'll run. Um, we'll do a questionnaire to kind of see which children are more at risk for this to see if they need ongoing referral after. But um, there are a few sessions and specifically we're at with Alex where he'll talk about cognitive behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. We're um, teaching about kids how to deal with, with issues, how to think about food, how to think about why they make the choices that they do when they decide to eat. And then for, for those children where we feel like we're at even more um, increased risk or right. displaced, we're going to have, we'll do ongoing referral and counseling. Um, so yes, we, we definitely try mm -hmm. to address that as well. One of the things that we know is that there is hostigamiento contra los niños y niñas que son obesos. Y le pregunté a Charlotte si esta seis semanas, durante estas seis semanas se van a llevar a cabo algunas actividades para ayudar a los niños eh, bregar con esta situación del hostigamiento y dijo que sí, uh, van a traer un consejero que va a asesorar a los muchachos en cuanto a por qué comen ciertas cosas o quizás por qué comen tan frecuentemente y también para esos niños que demuestran eh, y indican que tienen un, un problema de hostigamiento, sea en la escuela o en el vecindario, eh, se le va a proveer estrategias para cómo lidiar con esa situación, uh, ya que se sabe que eso existe en, nuestra, en casi todas las comunidades, pero hay que ayudar a los niños a sobrepasar esas eh, situa situaciones. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit in terms of obesity and you got you have some statistics first of all about Pennsylvania but then you also have a breakdown in terms of racial ethnic groups mm -hmm. and I'd like for you to uh, uh, review that with us so um, these statistics are from 2013 and um, the overall prevalency of childhood obesity was 29.7 percent of children were considered either overweight or obese in Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, and then just specifically regarding nationwide, um, all for all children rates among um, specifically to obesity, so above the 95th percentile, 16.9 um, percent of all children. Um, and then breaking it down by race and ethnicity, black children had tw were 20.2 percent, Latino children 22.4 percent, and then white children 14.3 percent. And so there's definitely a large degree of disparity. Mm -hmm. um, una cosa que le pregunté a Charlotte es sobre hay algunas estadísticas eh, en Pensilvania Casi el 30% eh, de los niños son considerados eh, obesos, número uno. Now, the, the, break, the racial ethnic breakdown, is that Pennsylvania or is that U.S.? Uh, that one was specific to U.S., but I have some of the Pennsylvania trends as well. Okay. Um, y entonces, uh, en Pensilvania, eh, el número para todos los niños es casi 17% considerado obesos. Eh, entre la población eh, blanca anglo eh, es 14%, entre los afroamericanos el 20%, y entre los latinos en Pensilvania, hablando de niños obesos, eh, tiene la mayor tasa y es casi el 23% de los niños latinos en Pensilvania eh, son considerados obesos según las últimas eh, estadísticas. You have some other statistics for us for PA? So, um, specifically for, by Hispanic origin, the percentage of overweight or obese children in Pennsylvania is 53.5%. Um, 53.5%? Mm -hmm. Okay, African, do you have for African American as well? Um, 43%. Okay, and white Anglo? And this one does not have the, that one I just have a nationwide. Okay. Señoras y señores, tengo aquí una data eh, sumamente, bueno, que me so, sombrado a mí. Uh -huh. eh, entre los, esto es para Pensilvania. Entre los niños latinos, 
hay casi un 54% de todos los niños en, latinos en Pensilvania considerados obesos. Generalizing here, do, do we know, let's say, out of those, out of that 50, almost 54%, what percentage of those is a good chance that they'll be diabetic? Mm, that would be difficult to say. Um, a very high percentage. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're obese as a child, then you're pretty much guaranteed to be obese as an adult if you don't do something to control your lifestyle. And if you're obese as a young adult, I mean, it's just a matter of time before you develop type 2 diabetes. Right. Uh, the other thing is, is, you know, kids are under the control of their parents, obviously. Um, what measures should parents be doing um, if their child seems overweight? Um, what should they do? Well, they should uh, make sure that their children are eating at least five servings of fresh fruits and vegetables every day. Uh, make sure that they're getting out inside and playing for at least an hour every day. Um, avoid fast food whenever possible. Any type of processed food, anything that can sit on a countertop for years, this is not something that's good for our body. <laughs> good for Don't anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then just really educating yourself about what's good for you and what isn't. I mean, I have honestly had mothers come in and tell me that their child had Oreo cookies and milk for breakfast and say it with no shame. And not that I would ever want a parent to feel shamed, but you just know that they really don't know. Like nobody would feed that to their child if they knew, truly knew how bad it was right. for them. And I guess the other thing to take their child to a doctor or clinic on a, right. on and, a regular. Right, and, you know, and instead of saying, worrying about like what the weight is for the number, just find out what percentile they land in so they realize whether or not they have to be concerned. Mm -hmm. eh, una de las cosas le preguntamos a Charlotte sobre eh, básicamente de este porcentaje, cuántos quizás van a resultar ser diabéticos. Ella no tiene, obviamente no tiene una cifra, un porcentaje exacto, pero según la experiencia y los estudios, la mayoría van a ser diabéticos. La cosa es que la diabetes no se va a manifestar en el cuerpo de un día para otro. Es un proceso largo de como 10 a 12 años. Eh, ¿Qué padres pueden hacer? Eh, una de las cosas es, es primeramente saber a dónde está a dónde caen en la escala de eh, que han la forma en la que han establecido para determinar la posibilidad o que es obeso número uno y posibilidad de ser diabético y obviamente las comidas eh, evitar comidas rápidas eh, evitar eh, comidas procesadas, comer frutas y también vegetales frescos, eh, si pueden diariamente la actividad, eh, ejercicio. Uh, ella mencionó fuera de la casa, pero le voy a hacer una pregunta. There's, the, there's an issue of, you know, we say your, your, your child, you know, play outside, be active. Now, there are, there are some parents who live in neighborhoods that um, do not want to let their children outside because they fear right. for their safety, so they rather have them in the house um, with some type of device to entertain them. What response do we have for, for those parents uh, in, in terms of strategies that they could, besides the, you know, the food and all that, but the, the exercise right. issue? Well, I mean, I, I, I would look within the community and find out what resources are available, where are um, some safe places that you can perhaps mm -hmm. walk to with your children. And if it's a matter of feeling like, well, I don't want to send them outside to play, well, then go with them. Mm -hmm. You know, go, and it doesn't mean you have to. I'm not a parent who enjoys, like, wrestling and <laughs> playing with my children in that, in that manner, but uh, a family walk. Right. And so something that you can supervise and feel good about because it's just as good for our bodies as it is mm -hmm. for our children. But really, it is important to just get them outdoors, get mm -hmm. them off of the devices. The devices aren't, they're really, truly bad for 
their brains and sleep cycles as well. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it, it does, you do have to try to incorporate ways within the community. Um, sometimes the local YMCAs will have programs, more programs, mm -hmm. especially during the summer. So I, I would just reach out in the community to try and find those. And if nothing else, just be your child's number one advocate. Go for the walk with them. Le, le pregunté a Charlotte porque una de las recomendaciones es la, la actividad de ejercicio. Sabemos que hay familias en ciertos barrios en nuestras ciudades donde eh, los padres temen dejar los niños afuera eh, por cuestiones de seguridad. Ella lo que dice, recomienda chequear qué organizaciones hay que tienen actividades eh, para los niños eh, para que ellos puedan hacer el ejercicio. A última instancia, ella recomienda que uno como padre, eh, si tiene que andar con ellos, uh, ande con ellos, que uno tome la iniciativa para llevarlos al parque o llevarlos a andar para usted y su hijo también, porque el ejercicio también es, uno pa bu es bueno para uno como padre, como adulto, eh, y hacer ese compromiso con su hijo o hija uh, para que puedan hacer ejercicio. Charlotte, I want to thank you, uh, first of all, for that upcoming session. Where do folks need to call and what do they need to do to be a part of that group? And they'll just call Southeast Lancaster Health Services and request to um, sign up for the Let's Get Healthy program. And I and the number should be 945-1560. Uh, no, 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 no. 299-6371. 299-6371. Bueno, el teléfono para llamar es el 299-6371. 299-6371. Charlotte, I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, y este ha sido otro segmento de Cita con su Salud. The following program is sponsored by Capital Blue Cross. El siguiente programa es auspiciado por Capital Blue Cross.